the north is complete devastation. This is one of the largest natural disasters to hit the region in a long time, if not the largest that we know of. We have a population in the affected region of between four and five million people at the moment. In the heaviest impacted areas, we're looking at um, destruction levels between 80 and 90 per cent. Therefore, you're seeing a huge number of people without houses, without water, without medical supplies. Ten of the hospitals in the area have been completely destroyed. We've had search and rescue teams over the last two or three days concentrating on eight destroyed schools. This earthquake hit at the beginning of the school day. So all the pupils were inside. And of the three schools now we have completely searched, not a single survivor. Not a single survivor. Not a single survivor. The United Nations is warning of a second massive wave of deaths in the earthquake-ravaged regions of Kashmir and Pakistan. Secretary-General Kofi Annan says it's inevitable that many more will die if the international community doesn't step up its relief effort. We need helicopters, trucks and heavy lifting equipment. It will require shelter and health care. We need up to 45,000 more winterised tents and temporary shelters. We need an estimated two million blankets and sleeping bags. We need ground sheets and stoves. We need water and sanitation equipment. We need food supplies. In Islamabad, the chief operating officer of the UN's emergency center, Andrew McLeod, repeated the plea. The humanitarian community here is underfunded by hundreds of millions of dollars. To be frank, I just don't think the world gets it. We have one of the best organised relief operations going here and we are just not getting the funding. If the second wave of deaths hit, it's the major donors that are going to have to look at themselves in the mirrors and ask why. There are more than 15,000 villages and towns in the affected region and many of them are going to be cut off from around about the 1st of December because of the decreasing snow line. We, we have such a short time to be able to give assistance to the most vulnerable people. This is not time for people to be penny pinching.
So this emergency operation to uh, reach the people is basically broken down into um, 10 clusters for planning purposes. We have food as one cluster, health, emergency shelter, camp management, IT and logistics, and a few others as the way we break down the organisation. So let me uh, walk you through, cluster by cluster, what we're doing in each bit. What I'm sitting on is a pile of CGI sheeting, corrugated iron sheets. This is uh, critical to the relief effort here because it's with these that we're going up into the mountains in the thing called Operation Winter Race where we are sending teams up, Pakistan military, engineers, volunteers, humanitarian organisations going up with extra CGI sheeting, recovering as much timber and CGI that they can from the uh, collapsed rubble of houses and building one warm room that we can put people in, put a heater in them and at least keep people warm through the winter so they can survive and then rebuild in spring. Where we are targeting at first people below, uh, between 5,000 and 7,000 feet altitude, above 7,000 feet people traditionally uh, move down below 5,000 feet we will be able to get to a bit later on but between five and 7,000 feet that's where the snow comes, it's where they're blocked off. The whole shelter strategy started from a group of volunteers that were working with us um, and we absolutely had no idea how to handle the problem that we're going to handle, how to get to 380,000 people between the 5,000 and 7,000 foot mark and these young kids came up with the idea of, of building a-frame designs on recovered rubble from corrugated iron sheets. We met a, game, a guy named Matt George who's a former Navy SEAL. I'm going to introduce you to Matt George, this magic yeah. Navy SEAL. <laughs> Matt, where did all this start? Well, with you actually, Andrew. Uh, you found me like an orphan wandering the hills up here of <laughs> Kashmir and decided to bring me in and uh, help me do what I was doing, which was building shelter off the, off the, off the uh, material that we could find on the ground. Um, we found a lot of people sitting around waiting for tents and we realized that with everything on the ground we could build, build, build. So we've been a more of a, we're sort of a motivating force. And we're really excited today because we're seeing something really quite remarkable. Uh, we, we were desperate for winterization and the snow coming in and what's going to happen and it looks like our distribution has really worked because 90% of the tents in this enormous, impressive valley are actually winterized. And I, I'm really quite proud to, to have been a part of that, quite frankly. And I mean, tell, tell us, the first time you came, you asked me for how many teams? Oh, that's right. <laughs> the, the first time I came to you, Andrew, I said, listen, um, I, 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 need, I need to put together five teams. And you said to me, five teams? How about an army? <laughs> and sure enough, you went out and got the Pakistan military army to to assist us and make it happen. But I have a big smile on my face today, more, more, more than the reason that it's just a beautiful day, is the fact that something beautiful is happening here. And these, I, I really feel for the first time that these people are really gonna make it. And it's because of, and it's because of these efforts that everybody has thrown their heart and soul into. During, during it's just beautiful time, up here. Uh... Yeah, these were the real crude early days. Um, just getting them up. They've modified it a little bit, which is good to see. But we just put this one up really quick and fast. We use rocks for nails, I mean for hammers. Um, this has changed a little bit. We try to use... It's okay? Asalaamu Alaikum. Is it okay to look? Is it okay? Is it okay to look inside? Yeah. So. What we were able to use with the beams here is we were able to make a floor so we could get them off the ground. Now I put gra we put grass underneath that to insulate it. And we, we call this house the boom box because we found that in here. Uh, no, this is actually a home. And you can see a great example of how they're staying warm up right in there. Ah, yeah. We didn't build this one. This is another one of the flat roof constructions that they like. I, I don't mm -hmm. know why they do that. I suppose because it... It is warm. The ventilation is... So they got electricity and fire. 
the uh, what they love to do is just take the tin sheeting yeah. and just throw weight on it, and then the snow weights it. Yeah. And uh, I think it's that philosophy that's actually caused a lot of problems with the uh, with construction here. I believe that in snow zones you should have chalet construction yeah. because. But that traditional design is more like this, and this is what's well, yeah, in the Well, yeah, the mountain hut with a thick mud roof just for insulation so you can huddle, you know, all, all winter. But you can do the same thing with this because you don't have the snow load on it. And these, I, I really feel for the first time that these people are really going to make it. And it's, because of, and it's because of these efforts that everybody has thrown their heart and soul into. Right, what you've got over my left shoulder here is the MI-26, which is the world's largest helicopter. It's often described as a C-130 Hercules with a rotor on top. It's a Russian-built helicopter. It carries more than anything else. It carries about 16 tons in best conditions. Given the altitude that it's flying here and the narrowness of the valleys, it only can carry about 10. What I mean by narrowness of the valleys is because the goddamn thing is so big, the wash that is created by the uh, rotors disrupts the airflow and the air circulation so much that nothing can fly there. And what you see it doing behind me right now is slowly lifting off with a net. And that's the way we're transporting a lot of the aid here, is slinging a net underneath the helicopter. You'll see it, it's coming up about here. And that carries the whole load of cargo. That drops it in a remote region over the uh, village that needs the food or the medical supplies or the shelter. And it drops the net with everything there. Then the smaller MIH helicopter comes in later on to retrieve the net and bring it back in here that we then use to cut another eight and ten with a relief effort. Pretty impressive sight, have a look. These um, big tents behind me, they're called rub holes. Well, rub hall is a, uh, is a brand name. It's basically a big uh, portable warehouse. So middle of nowhere, got a big rub hall, and we got we Natasha. She works for Joint Logistics Centre, does all the logistics, and she brings shit from down the valleys, well up here. What do you think? I think it's all about the view. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the bit that I can't get over is how much plastic sheeting has got up here in the last sort of three weeks. Yeah. Just in time for the snow, and so that you can actually come up on a day like this and look at the view and not, not with your heart dropping because it's so perishingly cold and beautiful and people have got nowhere to go. Yeah. The critical part of the logistics effort for this operation is in fact the helicopter support. The Himalayas is so remote and so hard to get to, many of the 15,000 houses, villages or population centres can only be reached by air or by long walk uh, or by donkey. Now now that the snow started to fall okay. above the 5,000 yeah. foot mark, a lot of the villages are cut off and the only way they can be reached is by these big helicopters. And we are trying to run out shelter, which is basically corrugated iron sheets and do-it-yourself rebuild kits, basic water supplies, basic uh, health supplies and food of course. So what have we got here Natasha? The oil is fortified with vitamin A. <clears throat> Why vitamin A? Vitamin A, you don't get it from cereals mm -hmm. to start with. It's something that you get from fresh vegetables and fruits, which is not what we're providing. Yeah. And it's also really important when you don't have a lot of sunlight. Hmm. So coming into a, a winter environment, that they only put it in because we're not using green leafy greens into, into the food basket, but it's an, an added bonus because we're in a winter and short day environment. So I know. Okay, what is this shit? 
these these are split peas, but they're, they're basically lupins, lentils, beans, legumes. So they're a crop that puts a lot of nitrogen back into the soil, so that's why we like to grow them from that end. But for people, they're really high in protein. So if you've got pregnant lactating people, if you've got young growing people, protein is what we're really after. And that's what you get, which you don't get purely from wheat flour. So wheat flour gives you a good basis. You can put some vitamins and minerals and enrich it, get all that going. But this is what actually gets growth and production. And I know it sounds like I'm talking about stock, but it's people that <laughs> <I> care. <laughs> the earthquake struck with enormous brutality, wiping out every primary, secondary and tertiary healthcare facility, including this hospital in Musafrabad, where you see an entire floor collapsing and crushing waiting ambulances. The international community has responded by sending in mobile hospitals, 60 of them, including this and another one from Australia. That's just a question before. Yeah. What is the medical staff? There's um, 20 medical people here. Um, there's basically five doctors, including myself, four nurses, and the rest are medical technicians, and there's one There's four teams of five. <coughs> four teams of five, and there's a doctor, a nursing officer, and three medical technicians working with it. So that's the team. There. Team five. I filmed home. Australia. Yeah, uh, Melbourne. <laughs> oh, trashy. <laughs> Hang on, we've got to Hollywood. support the Victorians. Ah! Who do you support? Richard. <laughs> 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 I don't support Richard. Fact, <laughs> 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 Yeah, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Richard. 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 Um, some, still some very sick people from the um, earthquake, but that, most of that's gone. Hi, I'm in uh, Banna. Banna is in the uh, northern part of Pakistan in the earthquake affected region. It's in the foothills of the Himalayas. Snow has started to come down a little bit. I'm at the uh, IHP camp, that's the International Humanitarian Partnership. It's a camp built for all the humanitarians. Uh, let me give you a bit of a view. So there we have the dormitory tents. And up the back, the light brown ones, they're the uh, office tents. Those particular two are for UNICEF. The uh, round ones are UNHCR tents currently used by the World Food Program in his offices. These ISP camps are actually quite good. They're um, nice tents, well heated, the cots kind of comfortable. And these particular ones are run by the Danes. What happens is um, Denmark, Sweden, Norway all got together, created the International Humanitarian Partnership and uh, look after things like uh, camps for humanitarians when they get here. They provide the showers which this morning were quite hot which is good. The little camp toilets, which are these things just uh, just here, and I'm just going to go into the mess hall now for breakfast. Mess hall. Good morning. Yan Yap, tell them. What, what do you think about this little camp here? Good morning. It's a five star hotel. Absolutely. It's better than college. Yeah. So there's not many. Uh, anyways, there's certain parts of college that I miss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no booze here, and there's no women here. That's true. <laughs> He promised us to bring in some whiskey, but I don't buy it. <laughs> now look at this. We've got fresh bread. It's not just warm in the middle, it's hot in the middle. Made by these guys straight out of the oven. Eh? Sensational stuff. Gaia. Both of them are full of shit, but anyway. And I just got, uh, let, let me show you this. I just got through a security check and never opened this one. This is really? my personal bomb. Yeah. Oh, your family back home. <laughs> You lucky people, having given your dearly devoted son or whatever to us here, all I can say is thank you. <laughs> I thought he would say well done because they don't have to put up with me and Larry does. <laughs> uh, no, he's actually doing a superb job uh, and I think he's indispensable. Not often I would say that, but he is indispensable and I'm going to encourage him to be even more indispensable. 
but he does need some edges shaping. Here's, here's the money I offered you. For <laughs> second. Now, I'm going to introduce you to someone very important because, as I've said to a lot of people, this is the best example of civil and military cooperation in any country, anywhere, ever, full stop. So I'm going to introduce you to Major General Nadeem Ahmed, who is the Vice Chief of General Staff and the guy who's made this whole operation work. That was very kind of Andrew, actually. He is the guy who pushed me doing all these things. So if there's any credit to Pakistan and Pakistan military, it's because of this white guy from Australia. That's I not also true, like him <laughs> because whenever there's a cricket match, he's on our side. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, everyone who's seeing it, uh, have a nice day. Uh, we are almost in the, near, uh, in the new year and hope that this year goes on well for all of us, both in the relief and the reconstruction thing. Indeed. And we come out successful as a more coordinated and a homogeneous team. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Cool. So when we look back now, after just over three months of this relief effort, it seems pretty incredible to see where we've come. At the beginning, when you listen to those first radio interviews, that we were completely overwhelmed by the size and scope of this disaster, not knowing how to reach it. And since then, we've got out over 300,000 emergency shelters, six, 700,000 tents. Basically, everyone is under some sort of shelter. By all medical criteria, the people are in better condition today than this time last year. 300,000 children immunized from measles. 20 mobile pregnancy units going around in an area that pre-earthquake, 80% of childbirth was done before medical assistance. And we beat the second wave of death. When we feared, and you heard the Secretary General referring to a massive second wave of deaths, not a single person died from secondary infection. We beat the outbreaks of cholera when they hit and there was only one or two people that ended up being infected. And the death rates from the cold are less than those recorded from last year. So now it's time to move into the recovery time. We've still got to beat the last bit of the winter, but now we've got to look forward to recovery. When I look back on this last three, four months, it certainly has been the most fulfilling and, and I think useful time in my life. And it doesn't matter what happens to me. See what they've done is incredible.